Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Hozik, and I'm the Adult Programming Librarian at the East Brunswick Public Library. Thank you for coming to this virtual presentation of Exploring Telescopes and What's in the Night Sky in August. So without further ado, Isaac Asaurus is an East Brunswick resident who enjoys amateur astronomy, 3D printing, and tinkering with Raspberry Pi microcomputers. He is also a NASA Solar System Ambassador committed to communicating the science and excitement of NASA space exploration missions and discoveries with people in his community. Welcome, Isaac. Thank you so much, Melissa. Good evening, everyone. So as Melissa has said, I am Isaac Osores, local East Brunswick resident and dear local NASA Solar System Ambassador. I'm truly excited to I give the presentation today, which is titled Exploring Telescopes and What's in the Night Sky in August. Let's get started. If you know the punchline, just put it in the chat. I'd be curious to know if you've heard these already, but why can't you get good cell reception in space? That's because there's zero G. I, I know you're muted, but I can hear the groans. <laughs> anyway, I'll go straight to the agenda since we don't really have to wait anymore. I'll give a quick introduction of myself, as well as what is a solar system ambassador, I'm sure you're wondering, as well as what are the common types of telescopes that are available. With that, I'll quickly go into eyepieces, mounts, and accessories. There are a ton of things that I won't be able to cover in today's talk, but I did want to just quickly mention them so you have an idea of things to look out for. Once we have that set, I'll go through the East Brunswick Create Telescope Kits that are available through the library. In fact, if you're looking at my video, you can see when after that, I will discuss what's in the sky for August 2021 and then leave you with some takeaways that I think will be very beneficial if you're interested in pursuing amateur astronomy, looking through a telescope and things of that nature. And then, of course, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Really quickly about myself, my name is Isaac Osores. I'm an East Brunswick resident. My family and I have lived here for about seven years now, and we absolutely love the town. As Melissa mentioned in my introduction, I'm a huge 3D printing nerd. I love the technology. I think the fact that you can take an idea, sketch it out, measure, design it in CAD software, and then print it and have a physical prototype just hours later is phenomenal. And in fact, if you see on my slide on the left, you see a 3D model of myself. I actually got myself 3D scanned at an event called World Maker Fair. I'm unsure if anyone's familiar with this event, but a couple of years ago, they held one in New York at the Hall of Science where a booth was offering to 3D scan folks for a fee. And sure enough, I got myself scanned and now I have this file that I can print at will. And in fact, here's one such 3D print of my head. And I, <laughs> I can 3D print myself whenever I like. So I, I think that's pretty neat. But besides when I'm not 3D printing, I love tinkering with Raspberry Pi computers, Arduino boards, anything of that nature. It's a very powerful little device. If you're not familiar with a Raspberry Pi. It's probably the size of a deck of cards, but you can connect sensors to it. You can create robots. I have a couple of dashboards around the house that show my calendar just to keep me up to date and things of that nature. So I just love tinkering with those little devices. I think they're very powerful and very useful. This, this saw the, the latest Mars rover Perseverance land on the red planet on February 18th, 2021. And it was just fantastic to be able to coordinate this giveaway with the library. So thank you, Melissa, for that. So I will jump right into the telescopes. So what are some common types of telescopes? And I put a little answers there to really clarify that we will be talking about optical telescopes today. Certainly there are other kinds like infrared and radio, but for the purposes of this discussion, we'll be talking about the following optical ones, which are refractor, reflector, and cardioptric. I have to keep saying that slash compound. So these are the three types that I'll be going over today. And we'll start with refractor telescopes. These of course, utilize lenses to blend light into focus. These are one of the more portable types of telescopes. 
the larger the lens, the longer the telescope tube would need to be for the light to travel. Would this in turn translate into cost? Because for a thicker lens, they will require a higher cost and thus the telescopes would get uh, a little bit more expensive than their reflector kind of parts. And some examples of refractor telescopes include doublet and triplet, which I believe I have on another slide to explain what those are as well. And pictured on the left, if you, you can see there the blue telescope, that's a refractor telescope. That's actually the starter telescope that I had, which really helped me get comfortable with using a telescope, familiarized with the night sky, looking at the moon late at night. This one in particular is the Mead Infinity Altism of Refractor Telescope. And that one I still have today, and it served me quite well to get into the hobby of amateur astronomy. So I found this really neat graphic that explains how a refractor telescope works. Essentially, the object that you're looking up at, at the night sky, whether it's a, a star or a planet, the light is going into the telescope is being refracted by the lens at the opening. At some point it does focus and then goes into the eyepiece, which can help magnify uh, and focus the, the image that you see. I found this animation that helps drive that point across as well. Here you'll see again, the orange lines are the light coming into the telescope. They get refracted by the lens. And in fact, this particular example is a doublet because it has two lenses here at the beginning, at the opening, which then refracts the image as it goes through to the eyepiece. Next up, we have reflector telescopes. And these actually utilize mirrors to reflect light into focus. Because the mirrors are easier to produce and they can be much less expensive than refractors of a similar size. So if you consider getting a reflector telescope of the same size as a refractor, you will find usually that the reflector telescope is much less expensive. Well, that's one of the many reasons why it would be. One of the things to consider with reflector telescopes, such as the one that's pictured here, it would require collimation, which is the realigning of the mirrors to achieve the best focus. So there is some the maintenance that you need to consider because of its size, consider this compared to the one that was pictured before, it can be difficult to transport. So certainly something to consider as well. I've had many times where I might be feeling a little lazy on a clear night and not want to bring out the Dapsonian telescope and would prefer to bring out the refractor because it's so, so much easier to move and set up. Similarly, if you're traveling to a dark site where you get really great views of the night sky on a clear night, you would have to consider, do I have to put the seats down in the car or can I just put it in and not have to worry about anything and just go? This is certainly something to consider if you're in the market to purchase a telescope. Of course, examples, like I mentioned, Dubsonian, this on the left. And also here on the left, the Newtonians are or I should say Dapsonians are a type of Newtonian that use a different mount. We'll get into mounts on one of the later slides, but that would help really clarify this year. So we'll move on. Again, I found this nice graphic on the NASA site that helps explain how reflector telescopes work. If you're viewing a space object, whether it's a star or a planet, the light comes into the telescope, bounces off the primary mirror to the secondary mirror, and then out to the eyepiece to view. Similarly, this animation shows the orange light going into the telescope tube, bouncing off the primary mirror, off the secondary mirror, and then out through the eyepiece. If you notice, if you follow one of these lines as it goes in, you'll notice that because it's bouncing off the mirror, and then off the second mirror, the image that comes out, it's actually reversed. So as you're viewing, it's certainly something you want to keep in mind. If you're looking at the moon, the image will be reversed, which is one of the reasons why you certainly want to use the finder scope 
on your telescope as that will be right side up and can help you navigate the night sky and focus in on an object, but certainly something to consider there. So here we have the compound telescope, which as the name implies, it uses a combination of lenses and mirrors. So as opposed to the refractor or the reflector, it has both, utilizes both. And part of the benefits of that is it becomes easier to transport and more portable. If we get to how it actually works, this animation shows light going into the telescope through the lens represented here by these two blue rectangles. It then bounces off the mirror, the primary mirror here, the yellow, and then off the secondary mirror into the eyepiece. So here, like I mentioned, it's utilizing both lenses and mirrors and is able to achieve similar results as the other telescopes. I wanted to include a slide discussing a lot of the different factors that you would need to consider regarding a telescope. Certainly a lot of material to cover, but just wanted to mention this. This could be its own presentation, but these are certainly three different things that are very important. Eyepieces, of course, being one of them. They do come in a variety of sizes. There's the 1.25 inch and the two inch varieties. I don't know if you can still see my video. So here I have a 1.25 inch eyepiece for a telescope. And then this is the two inch. So just to give you an, an idea of what's available out there, these are the two varieties. They do both have numbers on the sides. This small one in particular is nine millimeters and this one is 30 millimeters. And what that refers to is the focal length of the lens itself. And typically what the number means, the smaller the number, the greater the magnification. So if you're looking to really zoom in on an object, you'd want to use a smaller number focal length than a larger. Other things to consider are mounts. As you can see, you have the Altaz mount here on this Dobsonian telescope. And then you have the equatorial. The differences here are the, that the equatorial compensates for the Earth's rotation by having one of its rotational axes parallel to that of the Earth's. So that's where it differs with the Altaz. That one really just has two axes of motion where it goes essentially up and down vertical and then left to right horizontal. And then I also did want to touch on accessories, certainly not something you would need to get started on a journey with a telescope, but certainly something that you may want to have such as a smartphone adapter where you can place your phone on this device and then connect this to the telescope so that you can take pictures of what you're looking at, whether it's the moon or a star that you saw or or even a planet, certainly something that I enjoy doing. Besides that, I, I would certainly recommend having a red headlamp or flashlight. It certainly helps if you're in a dark site where you're looking to set up your telescope, but you're unable to see and certainly don't want to use a regular flashlight. And it's that, that essentially kills your night vision as you're getting used to the environment. What's recommended to use is a red light, which could be something like this, where you can put it on your, your head and be able to see what you're doing as you're setting up your telescope. And then certainly not least, uh, a Barlow lens is certainly something that is suggested when you're first starting out. What I've heard mentioned is it essentially doubles your eyepiece collection, and this is because the Bartle lens essentially doubles, in this case, it's 2X, it doubles your magnification or your focal length. So if you have a, in this example, a nine millimeter eyepiece, but you couple that with your Barlow, it's like having a 4.5 millimeter eyepiece. So certainly something to keep in mind, but certainly something useful. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned it. And as we continue, we'll start to get into the telescope kits that are offered through the library. This is the Orion Starblast telescope. Based on the website, it's compact. It's a grab-and-go reflective telescope. So like we discussed, it's using a mirror 
similar to my telescope. It's lights being brought in through the opening, bouncing off the primary mirror, through the secondary mirror, and out through the eyepiece. This particular telescope is 4.5 aperture, which refers to the opening. So that's especially good to know as the larger the aperture, the more light you're allowing to come into the telescope, the more you'll be able to see. So there's certainly dimmer objects out in the night sky that you might want to be able to see and having a bigger aperture would certainly help with that. It's listed as having a tabletop base for easy setup. And this is certainly something that I wouldn't recommend putting on the floor. You would want to have this on a table just because of its size and making sure that you set it up in a comfortable way so you can have the best viewing experience. And this is the website where you can get more information on the telescope itself if you're so interested. And I believe there's a way to put a hold or, or request it through there. Next up, we have the Celestron Travel Scope which is this one here. This particular one is 70 millimeter refractor telescope with an adjustable height tripod. It comes in a convenient backpack and includes two eyepieces, a 20 millimeter and a 10 millimeter. And this is the, the link to that particular one. And as we mentioned with refractor telescopes, it has the lens here, allowing the light to go in, focusing, and then producing an image for the eyepiece to see. And for that one, I was actually lucky enough to be able to borrow that kit. So this past weekend, my family and I visited the United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey out in Hope, New Jersey. If anyone's familiar with it, let me know. It's a great place to go. And I use it as an opportunity to test drive this telescope kit that I got to borrow from the library. And I have to say. My initial thoughts on the backpack, I was like, yeah, okay, <laughs> I thought it was more uh, of a gimmick, but I did really find it very convenient and very easy to transport. The fact that you could put both the scope and the tripod in the backpack with the eyepieces was fantastic. It did include two reading materials, which I thought was great. They're pictured there. It's the 50 things to see with the telescope kids. And then the 50 things to see with a small telescope there. I think that's fantastic. It helps really set the expectation of things you may be able to see with the telescope you just borrowed. And in fact, this is actually a picture of the telescope, the same one set up at UAC. And I believe we were pointing it to Saturn at that time. In fact, my son used the finder scope to, to point it to Saturn and then look through the eyepiece to see the planet through there, which was great. We're up to the what's in the sky section of the presentation. And so I tried to put this in order on the next slide. You'll see we have the phases of the moon, which really spans through the entire month, but we did have Jupiter at opposition officially on August 2nd, but do not fret if you missed it. Opposition is really when the planet is, is on the same side of the solar system as the earth opposite the sun. So what's really neat about that is that the planet itself will appear brighter and bigger, and it's a great opportunity to use a telescope to view and even take pictures if you're able to. So a great opportunity to do that. And it's not restricted to August. Really, as some people say opposition, it, it could be like a good three to four week period where you'll still be able to get the great views and the benefits of the planet being on the other side of the earth. So. Certainly look out for that if you're able to. On August 10th, we have the conjunction of the moon and Venus. And what conjunction means is essentially they are both visible near each other. It certainly doesn't mean that the moon and the Venus have come so close to each other, but instead in the field of view in the night sky, they will appear next to each other, which is great for, again, taking pictures or just for viewing experience. So look out for that as well. Of course, we have the Perseids meteor shower with its peak happening on August 11th. And what's really neat about this meteor shower is it really occurs anywhere between mid July and late August. But from what I've read a couple of days before and after the peak, which again is August 11th is the best time to view. 
with that said, in a really dark site with clear skies, you could even get to one meteor per minute, which would be really fantastic if you're able to and lucky. If you're not, and, <laughs> and the skies are cloudy, NASA will be hosting a overnight live stream. So if you're interested, I've included the link there. It's just go.nasa.gov slash 2021 Perseids, and they'll have a live stream set up to the night sky, and hopefully you can catch some meteor showers that way. Okay, next up, we have Saturn at opposition, just like Jupiter. This happening officially on August 19th, but again, really a three to four week period where you can get the benefits of Saturn being on opposition and benefiting from it being brighter and larger or appearing bigger in the night sky. Continuing on here, we have the phases of the moon with the new moon happening on August 8th, the first quarter on August 15th, the full moon, which is actually referred to as a seasonal blue moon this time around happening on August 22nd. It's a rare occurrence that happens, well, I guess not that rare, but it, it happens every two and a half to three years where blue moons, whereas this one is the third out of the fourth in the year. So be sure to look out for that on the 22nd of August. And then of course the third quarter on August 30th. So I know we covered a lot today and it was very at a surface level overview, but I did want to provide you with some takeaways that you could take and take a peek at and see if there's something there that's of interest. I've included a link to the NASA what's up website, which is great to stay up to date with what's up in the sky for August, September and onward. You can even look at previous astronomical events through that website. It's a lot easier. I would say just go to YouTube and check out the NASA JPS channel. They have a playlist of these WhatsApp videos that you can see, and it covers on a monthly basis, what to expect in the night sky. So just before September or at the beginning of September, they'll come out with the, uh, September edition of that one. So certainly look out for that if that's of interest. And I also did want to recommend the night sky network website. This is a website hosted by NASA that, that allows you to search a particular area for astronomy clubs. And what's really neat about those is I find that these clubs are full of a wealth of knowledge and folks that are willing to help, whether it's because you purchase a new telescope and need help figuring out how to operate it or are looking for recommendations or things to consider before purchasing a telescope. I find that people at these clubs are just absolutely approachable, friendly, helpful, and knowledgeable. So I would implore you to check out this website and check out an astronomy club near you because it's, it's truly beneficial. And with that said, I did want to shout out the United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey, UACNJ. They hold free weekly public events on Saturdays through October. Reservations are required. So be sure to check out their website, uacnj.org for more information and Again, just a wealth of knowledge can be found there. You can ask questions. They hold presentations along with their public events. So one week, it could be similar to this. What's up in the night sky for August. Another week, it could be about the planets, black holes, things of that nature. So if that's of interest, certainly check them out. All right. So we've made it to the question and answers section. If you are still looking to type yours in, I'll give you a couple moments there, but I did want to put up a QR code with my profile page on the NASA website where there is a contact me button. So feel free to go there and click the contact me, submit any questions you have there, if you would like, or if it's not a question or a comment, you can do that as well there. I did also want to provide you with a QR code for my Instagram. I use that mostly to post pictures about projects that I'm working on, whether it's 3D printing related or astronomy related, Raspberry Pi, Arduino related. So if that's of interest, feel free to check that out as well. So with that, we'll open it up to questions. So I see one recommendation for app in help recognizing constellations. 
Sure. So I'm an Android person. So on my phone, I actually have an app that I really do enjoy using. I can tell you what it is right now. It's called Skyview. It's a really neat app that once you put in your location, you point your phone up to the sky and be able to see what the different constellations are in the night sky. You can tap on planets and then see what their trajectory would be at a particular time. So if you're outside, let's say now, and want to see when you can expect Saturn to be at a good enough height where it's just above the trees in your area, you can go ahead, find Saturn, tap on it, and then see the, the route it's going to take and at what time it'll be at a good enough height for you to be able to see Saturn in your area. So that's, that's on Android on, on iOS. I've heard great things about sky safari from what I understand. I'm not familiar with the app myself, but I believe there's a cost to it, but I, I, I know folks that swear by it. So I think, I think it's definitely something to at least check out. Perhaps they have a free trial that you can try out and see if that's something that you like if, if you're on iOS, but for Android, I've had great success with. Skyview. Skyview is available in a light version in the iOS store. Nice. Thank you, Melissa. You're welcome. A lot of people, it looks like a lot of recommendations for where to actually find a dark sky in our area, which we had this discussion before too. Do you have any recommendation? It is challenging. I will say after searching myself. That's how I found the United Astronomy Clubs of New Jersey. And to be honest, after I went there, the one time I kind of stopped looking and just decided that that's the place that I'm going to keep going to just because I've had such a great experience going there on a clear night that, that, that is my de facto place to go to. There are resources out there. So if you Google dark sites, it'll show you a map of light pollution of the U S and you can see where there may be pockets of dark sites that you, that you might want to check out. Um, so I definitely recommend doing that, but honestly, sometimes it's, it's hard to make the trek out there just because we're so close to the city and the light pollution. And you really have to travel quite a ways to get away from it all. UAC and Jays in Hope, New Jersey. It's about an hour and 20 minutes away from East Brunswick, but I figure that's, that's a good enough distance to travel, to get some clear, some clarity in the night sky. So that's definitely a, a place I would, I would recommend. And it looks like Melissa brought up the Mars opposition, which occurred in October 13th, 2020. And it happens every 26 months. So great to know. Do we have any other questions? Oh, does, oh. does NASA make telescopes? I can't say that I've seen any NASA branded telescopes. I don't think there's any sort of partnership that I've seen with a, a particular brand of telescope as you're looking into purchasing a telescope, definitely consider your budget, what you're trying to see as well, just so you manage expectations that way. Cause I know a lot of folks that have had the experience where they purchase a telescope without having the sufficient research, where they'll get an idea as to what they're capable of seeing with a particular telescope and then try it and end up with not desired results. So you do certainly want to keep aperture in mind, like I mentioned earlier, the size of the mirror or the lens, the mount type. And if you're looking for astrophotography, certainly keep that in mind and that will inflate your budget quite some. But with regards to a specific NASA telescope, I should revert my answer. They certainly do make telescopes, right? There's the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Telescope that has yet to launch, but uh, if, if that's what you were referring to, then the answer would be yes. <laughs> but any optical telescopes that we can use on, on the ground, not that I'm aware. Do you have a favorite science fiction movie? 
I actually do. And if I, I don't know, if, can you see, if you see the, the posters behind, I have three posters on 2001, a space odyssey. It is my absolute favorite movie. There's just something about it, whether it's the aesthetic or the way it was, it was done that just, it's just mind boggling and it's my absolute favorite movie. I enjoy as a general rule, all things, science fiction and, and things of that nature. So yes, um, I would say 2001, certainly for movie. Isaac, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and some great resources and some tips and tricks. And hopefully people will be inspired to check out a telescope for free with their East Brunswick library card, test it out, and then decide if they want to take that larger investment and have one for themselves. Yes, that's certainly the hope. It's a very, very great hobby, in my opinion. And the fact that you can borrow a telescope from the library is just amazing to me. It's something that I wish I had when I was a kid growing up. So the fact that it's available today, certainly take, take advantage of it if you can, if you are interested. Isaac, thank you so much again. And we hope that everyone had fun and be safe and be well. Thank you everyone for attending. Have clear skies. Take care.